Now we will move to uh, Nihal Kayali, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, her dissertation examines refugee ac refugees' access to healthcare services in Istanbul over time by analyzing both, both the changes in the institutional terrain of care provision as well as refugees' experience uh, accessing various types of uh, care providers. Uh, before graduate school, Kayali worked as a journalist and researcher in Turkey, conducting various projects on refugee issues, uh, including education, child labor, labor and the role of uh, local government in refugee incorporation. Uh, over to you, Nihal, and uh, I'll remind you in the chat of the time remaining, if we can keep it uh, as brief as possible. And if anyone has question, uh, if, can, if you can write it in the chat, and maybe uh, Nihal can answer them towards the end of the presentation. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. So, and the talk should be under 15 minutes, if I timed it correctly. Um, <laughs> so my talk today will provide a small window into the experiences of Syrian doctors and patients uh, with the Turkish healthcare system, specifically in Istanbul. Um, since 2011, over 3.6 million Syrian refugees in Turkey have registered for temporary protection. Um, this legal status has made it possible for registered Syrians to access services and work legally. And of course, one of the main pillars of this legal status is uh, free access to health care. And this includes primary and secondary care, tertiary care with referral, emergency services, and coverage for medication. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge, like it's a quite a commendable and generous policy uh, that, that Turkey has put forth. Um, nevertheless, as Dr. Ammar also pointed out in his uh, study, there are uh, lots of difficulties um, in actually taking advantage of that right to care. And the most central problem has been and continues to be the language barrier. Um, but there are also bureaucratic barriers in terms of um, whether people have registration, which province they're register registered in, because as Dr. Amar noted, if you're registered in one province, you cannot um, get services in another province. So if you registered in Antep, but you moved to Istanbul, you can't get services in Istanbul. Um, finally, there are also issues of discrimination in um, hospitals, unfortunately, um, there are still cases of that. Um, and on the other side, so not just patients, but Syrian doctors have also faced quite a few challenges trying to um, find sufficient and accessible legal employment opportunities in Turkey. So there's there are issues on both access and provision side. Um, so my general research question for my dissertation, which um, I will only be able to talk about a slice of it today, um, but the broad question is how do institutional changes in healthcare provision um, affect access to care for Syrian refugees over time? Um, so here's a little timeline of like kind of important uh, events in, in uh, healthcare provision for Syrian refugees in Turkey. Um, one of the interim solutions that emerged to kind of uh, deal with these issues that I mentioned um, was the uh, emergence of ground up uh, humanitarian health clinics that were run by Syrian doctors um, because they couldn't work in the Turkish system. Um, and these were generally tolerated by Syrian I'm sorry, by Turkish officials for a while because they were filling a very clear provision gap. Um, the existence and persistence of these clinics also highlighted the important role that Syrian doctors could have in the provision of care uh, for Syrians in Turkey. So at the same time, and you can see on this timeline in um, 2016, um, the EU-Turkey deal um, sets the groundwork for some longer institutional solutions. So. As a part of the 6 uh, billion euro deal, 300 million euros were earmarked for what has come to be known as the Sahat project. This project is supervised by the WHO and implemented by the Ministry of Health. And the goal is uh, to train Syrian doctors to work in primary uh, care centers called migrant health centers, or I call them MHCs in this presentation. And these are supposed to serve as a first point of contact uh, with the healthcare system. And they're analogous to family health centers, which exist for Turkish citizens in, in Turkey. And so between 2018 and 2021, these centers were gradually staffed and opened. So my study um, 
is an interview based study and it specifically focuses on Istanbul, which I think it, it's it has some unique properties. Um, one of them is that it has a kind of high medical tourism industry. So private provision is a bit more common than in other provinces. Um, so it's not necessarily generalizable, but um, I've been doing interviews for the last four years and um, they're continuing. So my analysis is uh, not the full dissertation analysis at this point, but some some little things, some, some takeaways that uh, I'd like to share in the conference nonetheless. Um, so the main claim that I wanna make today is that while this migrant healthcare system has helped reduce the language barrier in uh, healthcare, there is still a persistent tension between healthcare policies that focus on primary care and demand for Arabic language uh, secondary specialist care. And this is two-sided. So it's it, there's both demand because doctors can't legally practice in secondary care um, as of now. So migrant health centers are their only option. And also patients who face challenges with secondary care continue to face those challenges because primary care doctors can only do so much to mitigate challenges at the secondary care level. Um, and so what happens in that case is that the combination of doctors who desire to work as specialists and patients who are seeking Arabic language secondary care uh, means that there's significant activity in the private sphere um, and it's semi-legal, sometimes informal and healthcare ends up being provided for a fee. So in the end, people are not able to always get that free healthcare that the, the state system um, legally provides. Um, so just to get into some quotes from my, my research, um, one 43 year old woman living in Fatih, one of the municipalities in Istanbul expressed the following. She says, we, we would visit the migrant health centers for general cases, but they don't have any specialists. The MHCs are good, but it's not useful for actual problems. If I want to see a gynecologist, if I want to see a heart doctor, my husband has a heart issue, I go to the Syrian private clinics. MHCs can't help us. Um, so while these, this intervention, I think is really, it is a positive intervention. And I should note that this is a very crowded slide, but if you look at the area that I circled, it's, um, it shows that 70% of Syrians who are registered with temporary protection are satisfied with these clinics. 20% are not satisfied with clinics. So they're a good intervention. I would just say that it's, it's not e enough of an intervention um, because it doesn't really address the fact that the primary care system is actually auxiliary to the way most Syrians utilize the Turkish healthcare system, which is by um, going to secondary providers right off the bat. Um, okay. So um, moreover, legally, migrant health centers are uh, only for refugees with temporary protection IDs. Um, so um, many do accept those who are unregistered and even like the Ministry of Health encourages it um, from at least the people that I've talked to in the Ministry of Health. Um, but in 2019, there was a crackdown on individuals who didn't have registration. Um, and so there are individuals who avoid the state healthcare system because they're afraid that there could be, a, a, someone could report them to the uh, officials if they don't have the right registrations. So as one um, manager of a private clinic told me, um, it's not just people without ID, everybody comes, all sorts of people come from all over, but this is the only place for people without ID. Uh, four months ago, when the government started threatening to deport people without IDs, some people left, but others have stayed. So this um, Syrian manager of a private clinic was saying, like, we need to exist because some people can't access the state healthcare system. Um, that being said, um, it's not only unregistered people who use private clinics, uh, semi-legal clinics. Um, others actually opt out of the Turkish state system after they have bad experiences, whether it's... Um, uh, a bad medical experience or um, discrimination is uh, something that I hear about, unfortunately, quite commonly. So another quote from someone that I spoke to, um, she had a, she went to a state hospital for a surgery and had a really bad experience. So she, she said, um, they did the surgery entering the heart through the arteries instead of the veins. It was a big mistake. They endangered my life and I had to stay in intensive care for two weeks. When I um, got out, I decided I would never go to a government hospital again. Um, after a while, I met a Syrian private doctor who was really good. He told me about a good hospital, a private hospital, but I needed to pay 
30,000 Turkish lira. Um, so we started to gather money, borrow money from people we knew. And I did the surgery two and a half months ago. I'm doing better now, but I still have the debts, 15,000 tele. The money is the biggest problem. I'm so tired in Istanbul just because of this uh, medical issue. It's been so exhausting. Um, and so I think it's important to show that Syrian doctors can be really important network nodes um, in accessing care. But when the, um, when the options are in the private sector, it can mean a big financial burden um, for patients. Um, so I'm gonna skip this one. Okay, so I wanna go a little bit to doctors' experiences in the system now. Um, so the persistence of demand for Arabic language secondary care has left many uh, Syrian doctors in limbo. Their expertise and services are hot in high demand, but legal options for practicing remain slim. So this leaves Syrian doctors in a difficult situation. Um, uh, some of them have jobs in the migrant health centers, but a lot of them don't. Uh, the majority do not. Um, and I spoke with one doctor who's working in a migrant health center. He said he was thinking wistfully back to his days uh, in, in a private semi-legal clinic. He says, the private clinics were much better. We were paid better. The salary in the MHCs is low. They don't consider how long we've worked. I have 35 years of work experience, but they don't consider it. Um, we have so many qualifications. Turkish doctors, of course, make much, much more than us, about double the salary. So, you know, um, some, some doctors are kind of frustrated with the working conditions in the MHCs. Um, and then there are doctors who are not working in the MHCs, but they're trying to get the equivalency. So they're trying to work legally in, in Turkey, but this also po poses a problem. So I'll go straight into the quote here. Um, one doctor said, there's a lot of steps you have to pass to get your qualification. First, you have to pass the exam. Then you have to do six to eight months training at a hospital. And the problem is, of this period is you will not take any salary and you have to pay the hospital because they will train you. Um, that's why a lot of my friends, they passed the exam and they didn't do this training because if they leave their current job, they can't live. And if you want to train, you have to leave your job um, because you can't do both at the same time. And I won't finish the quote, but he basically says, you know, um, I'll try this um, and, if, and then I'll get my certificate if I'm still alive, which kind of acknowledges when people are mid-career, it's quite hard to do these um, costly processes of equivalency. And then finally, one doc that I spoke with had done his equivalency and he was still facing problems. So he said, it's not possible to get the paperwork for the specialty equivalency at this point. The Syrian consulate will not certify our paper approving our specialty diplomas. And without that certification, the Ministry of Health won't accept us. So we're stuck. So he had done the exam. He had studied. He had kind of invested, used his life savings to not work and learn Turkish and take the exam. And then a bureaucratic um, kind of uh, standstill has made it. So he still can't practice his specialty in Turkey. So it, it's just been very frustrating for a lot of doctors. Um, so... In the end, uh, I would say that the formalization of labor with the migrant health centers uh, has been stabilizing for doctors in that it removes them from precarious employment, um, in, informal employment, uh, but it also produces difficult um, and sometimes unsatisfying work conditions where they say they kind of feel more like pharmacists than doctors sometimes. Um, and then um, a lot of doctors who don't work in the migrant health centers end up being stuck between attaining financial stability through regular um, but semi-formal work and legal stability through uh, government approved work that is costly to get. Um, and also patients depend on these doctors. You know, they, they, they trust them, they're linguistically competent, like they get linguistically competent care. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, there's a kind of a natural affinity to have specialist care in Ar the Arabic language, which has just been very slow to take off in Turkey. Um, and so I'm not a policy person, but I just want to uh, relate the recommendations that the people I talk to have for the Ministry of Health. And, you know, if I ever get the chance to make recommendations, I will. But one of the big things that they talk about is um, first having subsidized equivalency preparation. Um, and the second big one is being able to do the equivalency exam in English as opposed to Turkish, because in the end, a lot of these doctors will end up working largely with migrant and tourist populations. So if they just did the exam in English and then had like a supplementary Turkish uh, coursework or something, I think that would actually serve uh, the interests of the doctors and the Turkish economy and migrant um, uh, migrants who are seeking care. So 
Um, and of course, expanding translation in hospitals is, is always a good thing. Um, so uh, that's all. Thank you very much. And uh, next, we're going to move to uh, Dr. Ammar Hassan Beg, uh, who is a Syrian is a physician, graduated from Aleppo University in 2003 and joined the internal uh, medicine department in the university hospital. Uh, Dr. Ammar, for the past uh, eight years, has been working in the humanitarian sector, providing health services for internally displaced people, uh, refugees, and people with disability. And since 2017, he has technically led the Relief International Turkey program for refugees uh, in, in Turkey. Over to you, Dr. Ammar. And if we can try to, uh, to keep you. it uh, as short as possible, sorry, just for the sake of uh, time, and I'll remind you uh, in the chat of the time remaining. Okay. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon for everybody. Uh, first of all, it is my pleasure to participate in this conference, and it is a good opportunity to share our experience as RI in improving access to specialized health services for Syrian refugees in Turkey. And we will discuss uh, about we will present a case study about applying telehealth during COVID. Let's see if this can work. Okay. Our agenda for the presentation today, we will talk briefly about RI program strategy and achievement. We will talk about the disability prevalence among Syrian refugees in Turkey, COVID impact on refugees community. Talk as, as I mentioned, we will talk about telehealth and then wrap up with conclusion and some recommendations. RI Turkey. RI Turkey started in 2014, our main office in Ghazi Antib. Uh, RI provided a service for Syrian and non-Syrian refugees with main focus on people with disability. Because that our program strategy focusing more on improving access to, to health services, mainly for specialized health services, mental health and psychosocial support, physical rehabilitation, including the provision of mobility aid, prosthesis, orthosis, and assistive devices for, for refugees and mainly for people with disability. As well, we provide livelihood support for people with disability and other vulnerable community members. RI responded to COVID-19 to support the refugee camp community and as strategy, we will continue supporting, we will continue providing response to COVID-19 by assisting Turkish municipalities. And we still commit to build the capacity of local partner for their long-term sustainability. This is the location that RI work and is still working. We work in Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, Manisa, Gazi, Antib, Hatay, Kilis. If we think about the achievement RI reached and served a huge number of, of people, of of Syrian refugees and non-Syrian refugees. And you can see a huge number of people receive physical rehabilitation, received uh, mobility aid, uh, received ment mental health, psychosocial support. Now let's us understand the context uh, more by, by talking about disability, the prevalence of disability among Syrian refugees. I conducted a several to build, to make evidence-based programming based on Research need assessment for that RI conduct, conducted several need assessment in the intervention area. One of this research done in, co in coordination with London School. London School. And as you can see, the, the prevalence of disability among Syrian refugees is high and higher than the global estimation. And another find we can see in the big city where refugees face more hard situations, the disability was, was higher. And when talking about if those people, if those people with disability, the refugees with disability meet their need, we can see according to, to the same studies, same need assessment that we, we did know, the majority of, of, those, of those people with disability could not meet their need, still, still the need are not, are not met. And when talking about the barrier, why those people could not meet their need, talking about the barrier to identify the, the barrier to, to accessing specialized health services. Financial barrier considered as that on the top of the barrier because, because the new regulation of the, on health insurance in Turkey, the new regulation say that the refugees should 
pay fees for, for, for receiving health services. The, the regulation exclude all the, all the refugees who have their impairment, their injury before entering Turkey. The, the insurance did not or don't, don't cover the, the fees of receiving mobility aid, hearing aid, this, this kind of assisting devices. Still legal barriers consider from the top because as you know, all unregistered refugees cannot, cannot receive the service, cannot benefit from the service. Uh, the, the refugees who registered in one city cannot benefit from the health services in, 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 other, in other cities. Uh, still language barriers, people uh, facing a lot of difficulties in communicating with Turkish health, health staff, lack of number of interpreters, also lack of information considered as a barrier because refugees don't know where the service is available, how to register to the service. And finally, we can talk about the availability of service. When talking about specialized health service, you can take about specialized center to provide mental health, physical rehabilitation, to provide people with this precious material, prosthesis, artificial limb, orthosis, assistive devices, hearing aid, those not available in all, in all location. This is the, the, the context in Turkey before COVID, but how COVID exaggerate, how COVID makes this, makes this situation more complicated for Syria refugees, especially for people with disability. As the, ons as the ons of, of, of COVID sp uh, spread, I conduct need assessment to understand at the beginning, what are the, 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 the needs created by or produced by, by COVID for, for, for Syria refugees? And especially, again, especially because this is our mandate, our focus, people with disability. We, the respondents say we, we can find this major finding. For health services, the access to health services dropped from 87 before, before COVID to 29% after COVID. This is a huge drop in access to health services. And the similar finding for other basic services. For food, around 60% could not access to food, 37% didn't have access to hygiene material and 5% could not access to clean water. The major impact on livelihood status as 87% of the respondents for this need assessment reported that they or one of, or the breadwinner in their household lost their job because COVID itself. That means that COVID had a, a big impact, a huge impact on, on refugees community. But when talking about the impact on the service itself, RI and partners obligated to, because the COVID, because the protective measure taken by the government and ministry of health, we obligated to close all the center for three months, mid of, of March to mid of, of June. There is a lot of restriction on, on movement on the, on the health specialist to attend the center, on the beneficiary to, to come to the center. Even there is a ban on activity requiring gathering people, group sessions, awareness raising, and even the supply chain breakdown and this impacted totally on providing this mobility aid. Mobility aid. You, can, you, can, you can see here idea about how the service impacted by COVID. RI on monthly basis provided on average more than 5,000 services. This is dropped to more than the half on the onset of, of the COVID to less than, less than 3,000 services. There is a huge impact on service continuity. But RI at that time and before, even before the COVID spread in Turkey, but when we heard about the COVID and COVID spread globally and, and see and saw that there are lockdowns, restriction in movement in a lot, in a lot of countries, around the world, RI started to develop contingency plan, how to respond to COVID, how to avoid any interruption of service for, for this vulnerable group, uh, people with disability. And we, we came up with two solutions. First one, to, to refer all the, the patients to governmental hospitals or governmental health facilities or to apply telehealth. This, this solution came after massive disc research, consultation with our partners, consultation with the stakeholder and detailed analysis for the for the context. Unfortunately, the first solution was infeasible at that time because Turkish health system was overwhelmed with, with COVID cases and all the governmental faci health facilities shifted to provide emergency services and COVID-related treatment and no way to provide, to provide uh, 
uh, treatment for people with disability. So our I uh, take the final decision to apply telehealth. We started first to, to develop the guidelines for, for providing telehealth to ensure that we applying standardized and harmonized approach across all the center, detailed plan, avoid any harming to beneficiary, started with pilot phase for two months, then go with implementation phase. Five pilot phase for two months from April to May, to May 31st, 2022. In, in the pilot phase, only the, the specialist with extended experience with good communication skills enrolled only. We continue with the, the existing patient that we have. In the pilot phase, we provided more than 5,000 telehealth sessions to more than, to around 1,500 patients. Uh, at the end of, of the pilot phase, our, our I had to evaluate the pilot phase to, to decide to, to continue with, with implementation phase or to find another solution. We conduct satisfaction survey with the patient and the, the specialists, the findings were, were amazing at that time and everything encouraged us to continue with implementation phase. We started implementation phase in January, in June 1st, in June 1st, and we still continue until now providing telehealth. We expanded the implementation phase to include all the specialists and we receive at this time a new patient, not provide for the existing, we still uh, uh, rec we received a new patient. When talking after one year, if we need to evaluate this experience, sorry, I have just three, four slides in one minute. I can, I can, yeah. I can finalize. <laughs> Thank so, you. Thank you, Dr. Omar. I, I can read your, your body language. Okay. Okay. We, we try to evaluate this experience to see if, if it is, it is what it is working well or not. So uh, we, we do, we evaluated the program, the program data FC, two things. We have a lot of indicators to, to see if this is working well or not. The first indicator, if help vulnerable group, such as children and women to access more to, to the health services. And we see, yes, children, because of telehealth, access more for mental health, mental health activity, women, women, female, female patient, yes, because telehealth access more for physical, reha physical rehabilitation service. When talking about if telehealth can be applied for all musculoskeletal impairment or mental health disorder, as you see, yes. And when comparing with in person, yes, the same. We can apply telehealth for all impairment, for, for all mental health disorders, no, ex no exception, no, no exclusion. Uh, it, more, uh, the most important indicator about improvement, if the, if the patient got the same improvement by both modality, yes, as you see, the, the same improvement, the people got the same improvement by using in-person or telehealth approach. And the last indicator about the uh, uh, dropout, this measure the engagement of the, the patient with the treatment to see if the, if the patient uh, leave or left the, the telehealth uh, left the treatment because the telehealth and we see no the, the the patient have the same engagement even in telehealth and in person and we collect patient feedback through our program evaluation and the majority of the patients were satisfied with telehealth as conclusion supporting disability in turkey is still priority still priority because still we have a high prevalence of disability in turkey Disability, people with disabilities still facing a lot of challenge in accessing health services. And be, because there is a, a new regular regulation, because the lack of funds that impact a lot uh, providing the service for persons with disability. Telehealth was, was good, and we can, we can, as a humanitarian, apply telehealth when the situation or the context uh, suitable to apply telehealth. As a recommendation, we as RI, we still advocate to still the fund, still the continuity of fund to support people with disability. We saw now most of the donors skip from Turkey and still the need is high for, for, for supporting people, refugees, Syrian refugees with disability. As, as, as a recommendation, more in-depth research are required to explore more the current need, especially after one, one and a half year of COVID, the, the need may be changed and we need to have the, the new and RI now conducted two, two assessment, we'll conduct two assessment to explore that. We need to strengthen more providing this creative idea, one of them, telehealth to 
to have solution to access to health services by providing more training about telehealth, more orientation to people about, about about telehealth and providing people with equipment such as internet package, smart devices, and some instruments for home exercises in this. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, I, I, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ammar, for a brilliant presentation and um, very much needed, actually, program that. Uh, the first speaker will be Dr. Abdesal, Abdesalam Al Daif. He serves as the Turkey Country Director for the Syria Relief and Development um, SRD since 2013. He currently serves on the SSG and the HLG. Along with his colleagues, he co-founded the Aleppo City Medical Council and was appointed as the Public Relations Officer. Um, he also participated in establishing the Aleppo City Council, uh, a municipality office in areas no longer under the control of the Syrian government. Um, leadership was selected through a democratic voting process, which was uh, the first of its kind in Syria. Abdus Salam uh, was also selected as head of the health office of the Aleppo City Council. Um, and as a practicing physician, he served as the chairman of the Free Aleppo Doctors Association in 2014. Um, just as he was one of the founding members of what ended up being the most critical hospitals in Aleppo during its year under bombardment by forces, Al-Quds Hospital. In 2016, he was elected as the head of the health office of the Aleppo Provincial Council. And today, uh, we have the honor to have him with us to discuss the effect of internal displacement due to armed conflict on tuberculosis treatment outcomes in northwest Syria. Um, so, Dr. Abdesalam, the floor is yours. Afternoon, Good afternoon, all, and many thanks for the introduction. Uh, my study is about the effect of internal displacement to do due to armed conflict on tuberculosis uh, treatment outcome in Northwest Syria. Uh, tuberculosis is one of the infectious diseases which with high uh, worldwide border ranking among the top uh, 10 causes of death worldwide despite progress in control in controlling the disease in recent years. The world the WHO estimate that there was around 10 million new cases of tuberculosis and 1.2 million deaths worldwide in 2019. Um, about uh, 
25% uh, of all the world's population is uh, affect, uh, infected with uh, tuberculosis. Uh, for us, this loss, uh, displacement uh, of a result in relocation to camps, informal settlement, or other uh, under certain border shelters, which uh, with um, risk of uh, malnutrition, overcrowding, poor shelter, and unlimited access to health care facilities. To be among displaced population is suspected to be a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in crisis affected population, particularly in. Uh, armed conflict uh, uh, settings. Please, is known about the association between forced displacement and TB treatment outcome in armed conflict setting. Um, uh, since uh, 2012, the National and the Tuberculosis uh, Program uh, was suspended in uh, opposition group area in Northwest Syria. Uh, till uh, uh, 19, uh, 2019, uh, they would show in coordination with NGOs, uh, uh, hand in hand, Bahar and SRD. Three specialized TV centers were, were established in North of Syria, in Azaz, uh, in Azaz, Afrin, and Idlib uh, city. Uh, pre conflict prevalence of TB in Syria was officially 22 per, per uh, 100,000 population, with treatment failure rate of 10%. Uh, uh, no official figures from Northwest Syria are available concerning the current TB burden and unsuccessful treatment rate. Even in uh, uh, regime area, uh, the official figures uh, doesn't uh, didn't uh, reflect the real picture in, in that. Uh, the main aim of this study, uh, of this project, to investigate the association between forced internal displacement to do armed conflict and the unsuccessful treatment uh, uh, outcome among TB patient with uh, among TB patients in Northwest Syria. Uh, there is different objectives of this project, which is uh, described. Uh, I, I try to summarize the, the main objectives. Uh, describe the profile of TB patients in a treatment center. Uh, describe the proportions of TB treatment outcomes and change over time by treatment center and diagnostic category. Estimate the association of different types of forced displacement with the individual risk of unsuccessful treatment, uh, treatment uh, outcome. Uh, material and method. This study is a retrospective study using secondary data collected routinely in three TB center in North, Northwest Syria between 2019, uh, June 2019, and June uh, 2021. Uh, descriptive analysis was performed to analyze the main clinical and demographic characteristic of the study uh, participants, uh, univariable and multivariable logistic regression models, like mixed logistic regression model, were fitted to estimate the odds ratio uh, for this association of interest. Like I think this defi definition is important before moving to detail to, re to results, uh, and this defi definition based on the WHO guideline. Um, uh, the outcome treatment outcome for TB patient it is like uh, cured uh, treatment completed treatment failed loss of uh, loss to follow up and uh, and did. Uh, successful treatment outcome it is sum of cured and treatment com uh, completed outcomes and successful treatment sum of did a treatment failure and loss of follow-up outcomes. For the result, um, uh, here we, we just will talk about the demographic and clinical characteristics of identified TB cases. Uh, the total um, of the total amount of uh, cases is 753. Uh, we registered in this period in uh, three TB centers. 54% uh, were IDBs, whereas 45% um, were residents. Uh, male uh, accounted uh, for 53%, uh, uh, while female, it's about 47%. The main age of TB is about 35, which is a years, which is less than the uh, global or in similar context. Uh, um, similar context uh, uh, for a TB age uh, of infection. 73% uh, of uh, the participants uh, participant lived in rural areas, uh, camps, and village, while 26% uh, were from cities. 
Pulmonary TB cases accounted for 60% of the total TB cases, while extrapulmonary cases were uh, uh, on about 40%. 40, uh, 40%. Uh, this uh, this uh, graph, um, uh, looking to the graph, found that in the quarter uh, three, 2090, we had uh, 145 cases. And this declined in, to reach uh, in uh, 30, 90, 93 cases in quarter four, uh, 2020. Uh, the overall uh, success, treatment success rate, it was 70% of all patients during the study period uh, with significant difference between IDBs. Uh, it is uh, almost 60% uh, among IBDs, IDBs and 89 uh, 82, sorry, a percent among uh, residents. Uh, looking on this table, we'll see that in quarter uh, four, 2019, the uh, highest uh, unsuccessful treatment rate was in this uh, period, on this quarter. Uh, and the, the main uh, uh, things in, in this quarter, we see that the main, the main participant for this percentage, it is like a uh, loss to follow up. And this is was related to the huge displacement movement, uh, which have been in this uh, in this area, which is documented more than almost around one million people displaced from the southern part of Idlib uh, due to the armed conflict. Uh, displaced uh, displaced uh, TB patient had uh, an elevated risk of experience uh, unsuccessful treatment. TB treatment compared to non-displaced patient adjusted. Uh, so the adjusted odd ratio, it is 2.66, uh, 95 confidence intervals, so 1.83 to 3.88. Uh, with higher risk of uh, for displaced people living in camps. Um, also, we found that this displaced patient living in camps were 3.38 times more likely to develop unsuccessful treatment outcome compared to resident patients, whereas, whereas displaced patients living in cities and village were 2.82 and 1.9 times respectively more likely to develop unsuccessful treatment outcome compared to residents. Uh, strength, uh, study strengths. This study is the first epidemiology research study about tuberculosis in, nor in Northwest Syria, which studied the association between displacement and the unsuccessful treatment outcome in uh, TB outcome, uh, which is uh, considered and one of the most complex uh, settings uh, due to the ongoing uh, conflict there. Finding generated from this study may help to improve the medical practical uh, practice in other conflict settings where, uh, where uh, there are a large number of IDBs in order to achieve better TB diagnosis and treatment. Helpful information was obtained about notified TB cases and TB treatment outcome and change over time to assess the TB program uh, uh, performance over two years of implementation. Uh, limitation study design and data validity. Uh, this is a retrospective uh, uh, cohort study, which is uh, data, it's like uh, maybe affected. And uh, it, uh, there is a lot of turn off uh, among uh, uh, staff in this period to do to uh, displacement, and this might affect the validity, data validity. And also information bias uh, related to exposure and outcome measurement errors. And also, there is an uh, issue related to residual confounding, such as duration of symptoms before treatment, probation, and other comorbidities. Uh, conclusion and recommendation the study indicates that forced displace, uh, internal displacement because of armed conflict has a negative effect on TB treatment outcomes, especially uh, among people uh, reside in camps. Uh, the available evidence from this study will have important implication in designing appropriate strategy to control tuberculosis by equipping policymakers, NGOs, donor, and health security with a more comprehensive understanding of TB in Northwest Syria. Thank you. Hopefully, on time.
Brilliant, brilliant timekeeping, actually. Thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you also for a really interesting presentation. I think it's actually kind of hitting the nail on the head in terms of the objective of the overall uh, research conference, which is to kind of combine the, the very much like implementation side of, of the humanitarian industry with the research um, with the research and academic world. So it's, it's really spot on. Thank you very much for that. Um, I see we've got some questions coming in, but I'm actually going to move on to the next presentation and keep the questions for the very end, if that's okay.